Thank you and welcome. Uh, we've got a present today, presentation today regarding basically some of the hot topics in oil and gas litigation. Um, my name is Greg Meese. I am a trial partner here at Holland and Knight. I've been at Holland and Knight and its predecessor, Thompson Knight, for almost 37 years. And with me is Megan Schmidt. Uh, Megan also has been a, a lifer with us for going on 14 years now. So we're both in the trial section and we both have spent either fortunately or unfortunately, a lot of our lives dealing with uh, these oil and gas types of issues. So we're gonna, um, we're gonna work through uh, this. We've got a, a, a good bit to cover today. Hopefully it will be um, interesting. Uh, because we're lawyers, of course, we've got to have a disclaimer. I'm not gonna go through them, but that's the disclaimers. Um, and then we're, you know, this is just sort of a list of some of the, uh, some of the issues we're gonna be talking about today. Um, as we go through this now was Megan and I were trying to plan this. We were really trying to figure out a way we could come up with something that would be interesting. For those of you who are fans of the big bang theory, I had suggested we go with a fun with flags theme, right? If, if you remember Sheldon and fun with flags, Megan quickly said, no, she then called me a nerd. So we decided, you know, we had, we could not do that, but we did decide what we're going to do is we're going to have, um, as we go through some of these topics, we're gonna to have some interactive polls. Um, and, and so you'll have the ability to, to answer in the polls and we'll be able to show you within a half a minute or so the results of, of, of those polls. And so, and by the way, for those of you who are wondering on this flag, this is a real flag. This is the official flag of Friesland, which is a Dutch province. Um, and those are not hearts. Those are actually the, they represent the leaves of the Dutch water lily. So Megan, I did get in some fun with flags, so there. All right, uh, let's get started. So first one we're going to talk about um, is, and I call this fun with math because this is the Van Dyke case and some of the, the cases that have followed on since it. Um, and so uh, this really is a question and, and we're going to start with our first poll question. So the first poll question is, what does one half of one eighth equal? And so you've got an answer of one sixteenth, one eighth, uh, if you were paying attention to the cartoon, it's one billion, or I was told there would be no math, so I'm refusing to answer. I actually used that one time in, in federal court and I did not get held in contempt by a federal judge. So we'll give it a minute to see, um, to let y'all answer. Um, all right. Um, Looks like uh, we're continuing to answer here. All right, so I'm gonna move on to the next one and see what the percentage were. We got 70% that think it's 1 16th, 15% that think it's 1 8th, 5% that thinks it's 1 billion again, uh, and then 10% like me did not wanna have to do any math. Um, and we're gonna see from this from this case, what the correct answer is. Um, so uh, this case, uh, Van Dyke versus Navigator, um, it's really the, the question about a fixed versus a floating royalty dispute and really what does one half of one eighth mean? So real briefly in 1924, the Mulkies conveyed their ranch and the underlying minerals to a partnership of White and Tom, but in that deed, in that assignment, they reserved one half of one eighth of all mineral rights in said land. So they reserved one half of one eighth. And then nearly 90 years later, um, the parties, which are going to refer to as either the multi parties or the white parties, depending upon where they derive their interest, started litigating about the true meaning of this 1924 deed. And, and to be honest with you, it, 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 there's something unseemly about trying to go back and determine whether somebody made a mistake 90 years ago. Uh, I think we all should be granted some, uh, some safe harbor. Uh, for example, the fact that I may or may not have gotten a tattoo 40 plus years ago, uh, I don't think we should look at that in today's light. Rather, we should just move on and focus on what the questions are. So, so in 2013, the white parties brought a trespass to title action uh, because the operator, they had drilled some new wells and they began paying the uh, royalties in equal shares to both the white and the multi parties. So the white parties, they basically argued that it's simple math. One half of one eighth was a one sixteenth. And that's all that was ever reserved. And that's all that they could, that they would be entitled to. 
as you can imagine, the royalty had changed from 1924, and so now there was a, a bigger royalty that had been reserved in the, in the new wells. The Mulkey parties argued, well, look, it's really a double fraction, and that's, if you gotta go back and look at what, what the common uh, terms were at the time, and that uh, the use of this really was trying to reserve a one half of, of whatever the royalty interest was. And there's this theory, this state misconception theory that, again, in the early days of oil and gas leasing, the reservation of a one-eighth royalty was so ubiquitous that one-eighth became a generic placeholder for royalty. Um, and, and those of you who have ever reviewed these know that one-eighth, especially in the 30s and 40s and, and, and even into the 50s, one-eighth was very common in these, in these instruments. Um, both parties moved for cross-summary judgment. The court actually sided with the white party. So they basically said it's a one sixteenth interest only. So in essence, it's a fixed royalty. Um, the court of appeals affirmed the trial court's order. So you would think well, that's it, but no, wait, we have the Texas Supreme Court coming to the rescue. So they reversed the lower court's holding. Um, they had previously held in a case called the High Saw versus Dawkins that a royalty reservation of one half of one eighth does not always equal one sixteenth. Uh, they, they focused on the fact that you've got to look at the, the meaning of the words when the text was adopted. So it looked at the facts of this case and it said, look, under the estate misconception theory, the monkeys held a floating royalty, not a fixed royalty, and thus they own one half of the royalty, which would be one eighth if the royalty was one quarter. So for those of you who answered one eighth, you were right. For those of you who answered one sixteenth, you were right. It just depends, right? The one billion, you probably, um, uh, I, I don't know that I can stretch it that far that you were right. Um, in this Van Dyke opinion, the court expanded upon High Saw somewhat and adopted somewhat of a rebuttable presumption in favor of this estate misconception theory. Since that time, there have been several courts of appeals decision, primarily in Midland, uh, which makes sense since a lot of this is out in the Permian. They have applied Van Dyke and they have found a floating royalty. In fact, there's a saying now that everything floats in Midland because the Midland Court of Appeals has found all of these to be a floating world. I think Megan's next. Great, thanks, Greg. Uh, so I'm going to start with the Freeport McMoran versus 1776 Energy Partners case. Uh, this is a case out of the Texas Supreme Court and it involves the uh, safe harbor provisions and the Texas Natural Resources Code. Um, so just to remind everybody about the background of this case, in the uh, Natural Resources Code, there's a provision that provides a deadline by which a payor must distribute oil and gas production proceeds to each payee. Failure to timely pay can result in owing interest and attorney's fees to the payee. But uh, Section 91.402B uh, does provide a safe harbor provision. And that is one that will allow a payor to withhold payments without interest under certain circumstances. Uh, so in this case, uh, the court looks at whether the safe harbor provision applied. Uh, let's get into the facts of the case a little bit. Um, so here we have Oventive and 1776 Energy and they entered into uh, multiple JOAs uh, for some oil and gas leases in Carnes County. Uh, then the Longview party shows up, it's Longview Energy Company, and Longview uh, sued 1776 Energy and claimed that two of the Longview directors unlawfully diverted these leases in Carnes County uh, from Longview to 1776 Energy. Ultimately, uh, Longview is successful and obtains a final judgment in the state trial court. Um, and in that judgment, uh, the court held that 1770, 1776 Energy must transfer its interest in these leases to Longview. And until it makes that transfer, it has to hold the leases in a constructive trust in favor of Longview and it also provided for monetary damages. Uh, now, of course, at this point, 1776 Energy uh, goes ahead and posts a supersedious bond. That essentially means that it stops the enforcement of this Longview final judgment while it takes the case on appeal. 
Uh, now, Aventive learns of the Longview judgment and then immediately stops uh, providing any production payments to 1776. Uh, this does not sit very well with 1776. Uh, in fact, 1776 uh, sues Oventive right away, uh, even before the appeal of the Longview judgment makes it all the way through the courts. Uh, but ultimately, uh, 1776 was successful. Uh, it gets up to the Texas Supreme Court. That court reverses the Longview judgment, at which point Aventive pays the withheld funds to 1776. But here's the rub for 1776 anyway. Oventive did not pay any interest on the funds. Uh, so let's look closer at this section 91.402B. These are the two uh, provisions of the safe harbor uh, provision in the code that Oventive relied on. Uh, the first being that this was a dispute concerning title that would affect distribution of payments if that Longview judgment was upheld on appeal. Second, Oventive said we had re a reasonable doubt about whether there was clear title to the proceeds. And so on those two bases, Oventive was correct in withholding uh, interest. At least that was their position. In contrast, 1776 argued uh, that the Longview judge judgment did not affect the distribution of payments. And here's the reasons. They say, well, uh, the Longview judgment actually did not immediately result in the transfer of the leasehold interests. So we, 1776, still retain legal title. Second, 1776 said, regardless, we are holding uh, those leasehold interests in a constructive trust for the benefit of Longview. Uh, so production payments should have been ongoing to us for that reason. And then third, 1776 said, well, we suspended the enforcement of that judgment by filing the supersedious bond. Uh, the, co the court heard those arguments but at the end of the day, the court looked back to the plain language of the statute. And again, here's the plain language. Uh, the court based quite a bit of its opinion on looking at the definition of the word would, as well as the definition of the word effect. But I'd like to ask you all, when did the word would first appear? Was it the Middle English period? between 1150 and 1500? Uh, was it the old English period uh, between 450 and 1066? Uh, how about the Roman period or final option, it's all Greek to me? Uh, go ahead, take a minute and uh, let us know what you think. When did the word would first appear? Uh, a word that this court bases uh, quite a bit of its opinion on. Just give it a couple more seconds. Okay, drum roll, please. Let's see, uh, the Middle English period, 13%, Old English, 35%. Uh, my favorite though, it's all Greek to me. The answer is the Middle English period. Uh, so I raised this just to note that uh, this opinion is a uh, uh, strongly based on a word that we've been using for uh, pretty much almost a thousand years. Uh, so the court found that the word would meant a contingency or a possibility in the future. So regardless of 1776 arguments that that Longview judgment did not currently affect distribution of payments because it would potentially affect those payments uh, then the first provision in the uh, safe harbor uh, provision in the code applied. Uh, and then secondly, under the second provision, the court did find that Aventive had reasonable doubt as to clear title to the uh, proceeds of the production. Uh, so in the end, Aventive won and Aventive was entitled to withhold interest. All right, thanks, Megan. Um, 
Next, uh, we're going to look at uh, a case involving water. Uh, and again, keeping upon our theme of, of being blocked from doing fun, uh, fun facts with flags, we're going to do fun facts about water. Um, so did you know that there is the same of water, amount of water on Earth today as there was when the Earth was formed? So the water has never dissipated. Uh, almost 90 percent, 97 percent of the world's water is undrinkable, another 2 percent in glaciers. So really, we're looking at 1 percent of water is available for all of humanity's needs. And more than 90 percent of the world's supply of fresh water is located in, in Antarctica. Water is the only substance on Earth that's found naturally in three forms, liquid, solid, and gas. Water is called the, uh, this one I found fascinating, water is called the universal solvent because it dissolves more substances than any other liquid, even sulfuric acid. But I, I think probably the most important fact, the one that's vital, is that it takes approximately 20 gallons of water to create one pint of beer. So. What does water have to do with the next case? Well, this is a case uh, involving two uh, entities which had conflicting claims to water. COG was the, the mineral lessee uh, on about 37,000 acres. They also had some uh, surface use agreements and right-of-way agreements uh, with the surface owners to facilitate uh, their use of the surface estate for their operations, including uh, transporting the product and transporting the waste from the well. Subsequently, Cactus had entered into some water lease agreements with the surface owners, which purportedly gave it the right and ownership of all the water produced from the formations, from the own gas wells, all of the water um, is what Cactus was arguing. Um, so Cactus then sues and in the lawsuit, uh, Cactus contends that the oil and gas leases only granted COG the right to oil, gas and other hydrocarbons. We've all seen that. That's the typical language um, in a lease is the oil, gas, and other hydrocarbons. And because water is not a hydrocarbon, Cactus argued that the produced water was not conveyed as a part of the mineral estate. Now, COG argued, well, look, it's all a part of this one combined product stream, uh, and therefore it owns the produced water as a waste byproduct. It also said there's some other provisions of the leases that provided both the right and the obligation to dispose of the waste generated by the wells. Um, this is a simple uh, diagram. Uh, I'm sure most of us on this, on this uh, call um, are, are familiar with this, but it basically shows how produced water is, 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 is actually developed uh, and how it flows back out of the well, and then it goes for treatment. Um, one of the things the court spent a lot of time on was analyzing what actually was produced water. Um, and it, 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 it made some findings that obviously it's water that's produced back to the surface um, during the oil and gas production. It's typically brackish and, 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 and for anybody who's ever been out there, it contains a very high level of salt. It's got a very uh, concentrated saline. Um, and then forever, for, for those of you who are involved in operations, produced water has really been recognized as a waste byproduct um, and, and, and not really, it's not been associated with groundwater, um, treated as a liability, um, and, and the surface owners typically have never claimed ownership with it. However, given the scarcity of water in many of these shale plays, produced water has become much more valuable in recent years. In fact, if you look at some of the, some of the, um, professors at, at A&M are doing some fascinating things where they're trying to develop some low cost ways of, of, of trying to trap and, 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 and extract the minerals that come up as a part of this produced water, because there's lithium, there's all sorts of things that, that come up with this produced water. Um, and if, if, if they can do it on a low cost or a, a, a very economical basis, it's gonna really increase the value of this produced water. Now, the, the court really didn't um, get into the, into the question of how much of the value, uh, what that plays in it. It was really focused on who owns it, right? And so what the court found was that Produced water is not groundwater, so it doesn't belong to the surface estate. Rather, it's simply oil and gas waste, and it's owned by the holder of the mineral lease, uh, mineral estate. And really, one of the things it looked at was, you know, if, if it were to give Cactus this right, it would be giving the surface estate the benefit of something um, that, that someone else has, has invested all the cost and the resources and was required to perform. In fact, um, COG had, had put on it evidence that 
They had spent over $20 million in the past, in the four years leading up to the lawsuit, just on handling and disposal costs, primarily relating to the produced water. Uh, there was interestingly a strong dissent and Cactus has filed a petition uh, for review with the Texas Supreme Court. So stay tuned, this one may, uh, it, 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 it could change somewhat. And if it does, it would be significant with regard to produce water. So now under a poll question, how much water does the average American household use per year? Is it 10,000 gallons, 50,000 gallons, uh, 100,000 gallons, or if you've ever had teenagers, you know that your your water bill may be equal to the value of your house each year. Um, but anyway, we'll uh, we'll let you uh, answer those questions real quick. Um, just so you know, I, I sprang this one on Megan and she got it wrong. So uh, there's no there's no uh, shame in being wrong on this one. Okay, um, we're going to go ahead and give the answers. 10,000 gallons, 50,000 gallons, 100,000 gallons, pretty, pretty equally split there. Um, the answer is actually 100,000 gallons. The average American household uses 100,000 gallons of water each year. Okay, Megan. Great. Uh, I'm next going to cover the Intervest case. This is a case out of the San Antonio Court of Appeals. Uh, it involves a dispute regarding uh, the construction of a gas royalty provision and a free use provision uh, with respect to fuel gas. The lessors in this case are Mayfield and Ingham, and the lessee is Intervest. Um, so, as you can imagine, Intervest collects the gas and it sends it downstream for processing and eventual sale. But to get it downstream, it has to use some of the gas to power compressors and dehydrators. Uh, and as many of you know, that is referred to as the fuel gas. And that, of course, is because, you know, downstream, the gas needs to meet quality specifications for the processing plants, as well as pressure specifications. Um, Intervest was not paying the lessors a royalty on this fuel gas, hence this lawsuit. Here's the royalty provision at issue. As you can see under this provision, the gas royalties are to be paid based on the market value at the mouth of the well. Uh, so Intervest was deducting the fuel gas as a post-production cost from their total royalties. Uh, based on this uh, market value at the mouth of the well language. The lessors, of course, disagreed with this, and they provided three main arguments. Uh, so listen close, because uh, this will be the next poll question, okay? Uh, first, the lessors argued that the gas royalty provision that we just looked at did not contain express language allowing for deductions. And they compared that gas royalty provision with their oil royalty pr provision. And in the oil royalty provision, uh, there was express language uh, regarding deductions. Second, the lessors argued that if you look at the free use provision, uh, that that limited uh, how the operator and when and where the operator could use gas free from cost. And we'll look at that provision in just a minute. And then third, they say, come on, court. Uh, Intervest's predecessor used to pay us a royalty on fuel gas, so uh, Intervest should as well. Uh, here's the free use provision. Uh, this provision provides that Intervest could use uh, gas free from cost for all drilling operations. And you can see that uh, language highlighted. And this is the provision that the lessors used to say that uh, Intervest could only use the gas for free for drilling operations on the, the premises. Uh, so quick polling question. What do you think out of the three arguments that the lessors made, which argument do you think was the most compelling? Was it uh, A, 
that the gas royalty provision did not expressly allow for uh, any expense deductions? Was it B, that the free use provision limited the ability to use gas free uh, to just drilling operations on the premises? Third, was it the past conduct of Intervest's predecessor? Or finally, you fell asleep and you want to know, what are we talking about here? Uh, take just a second and uh, let me know what you think. Okay, let's go ahead and start to see how it's looking. Um, okay, we've got 50% uh, leaning on past conduct. Uh, the next runner up is 30% on the free use provision and 10% are asleep. So Greg, you're really gonna have to pull your weight a little a little more in this presentation. Uh, well, the answer is a uh, trick question. The court didn't like any of the arguments. Uh, so gotcha. Uh, the court actually held in favor of Intervest. The court uh, said that fuel gas is a post-production cost. And because of the royalty provision being market value at the mouth of the well, uh, Intervest rightfully uh, deducted that cost. Uh, the court importantly held that the free use clause did not alter the gas royalty provision. Uh, and then finally, the court said, because the language in the lease was clear and unambiguous, whatever the parties did in the past was completely irrelevant. Uh, you could hear from me one more time on the Finley case. This is a case from the Texas Supreme Court, and it involves release language contained in an acreage swap agreement. Uh, now, bear with me a minute because we need to get into the background facts just a bit here in this case. Uh, this case involves the Arrington lease. Uh, under this Arrington lease, uh, Finley had the shallow rights and Headington held the deep rights. Finley was also the operator of two wells, uh, but the parties get into a dispute, Henley and, uh, uh, Finley and Headington, because Heading Headington alleged that it lost its uh, deep rights uh, because Finley failed to uh, keep the lease due to non-production from those Arrington wells. Uh, Headington also alleged that Finley failed to provide Headington with the contractually required notices that would have allowed Headington to uh, step in and, and save its rights. Uh, in the middle of all that, uh, Petro Canyon acquired a top lease that would become valid when the Arrington lease expired. So where the parties end up in resolving all of this, or at least so Petro Canyon and Finley think, is that Finley assigns whatever rights it had left under the Arrington lease, whatever was there, uh, it assigned those to Petro Canyon in a quick claim assignment. Separately, Headington and Petro Canyon enter, an, enter into an acreage swap agreement. So essentially, Headington gives Petro Canyon its deep rights and another tract, and in exchange, Headington got all of the rights, both the shallow and the deep, in this Loving County tract, uh, but Headington was not happy. Uh, according to Headington, uh, it suffered monetary damages because under this acreage swap agreement, it was really getting a lower net revenue interest in the Arrington lease. Uh, so, it, you know, essentially, it's not going to make as much money as it would have uh, if Finley had, you know, behaved correctly. According to Headington. So that leads us to the true heart of this case, which is the release language. Now keep in mind, the acreage swap agreement is between Headington and Petro Canyon. Now please do not uh, read this whole paragraph. I am not asking you to. Uh, just focus on the blue language and the yellow. And the blue I've highlighted that Headington has agreed to waive any and all claims it has with the parties that are in this blue language. Note that I have predecessors bold and underlined because this case is about who qualifies as a predecessor 
that Headington released. And the claims being released are this described in the bold yellow. Uh, any claims related in any way to that Loving County tract. Uh, so we're focusing here who is covered by the predecessor language. And then with the total risk of getting into the weeds here, there's one more important provision you must know, which is that the parties expressly excluded from the release the liability for plugging and restoration of the Arrington wells. Uh, so we can keep that in mind going forward. So the question for the court did Heddington release its claims against Finley? Um, let's find out. For your consideration, I'll give you the two sides of the argument. Heddington said, no, I did not release my claims, my claims against Finley because Finley was nowhere referenced in the acreage swap agreement. The acreage swap agreement did not anywhere mention Heddington's claims against Finley and nowhere did it mention specifically the Arrington lease. Uh, so for Heddington, predecessor in the release was referring to Petro Canyon's predecessor corporate entities. Uh, and Heddington ar argued it could not be the pre predecessor well operator because we expressly excluded the liability for plugging the Arrington wells. Now for the other side of the argument. Finley and Petro Canyon said that predecessor did include Finley uh, in two different ways, as predecessor in title under the quit claim assignment and as predecessor in interest based on Petro Canyon assuming its liabilities and obligations under the Arrington lease. Uh, they argue that Heddington knew about Finley's assignment to Petro Canyon when it entered into the acreage swap agreement, that that wasn't a secret uh, they point out that the acreage swap involved an exchange of title, uh, hence predecessor should mean predecessor in title. Uh, and they point out that Petro Canyon had no corporate predecessor entity. So uh, one last look, here's the language, and I want to ask you in the next poll, who was released? You are the judge. Was it the predecessors in title released, uh, and that would include Finley? Or do you think it is uh, Petro Canyon's predecessor corporate entities? Another option, could it be both? And then finally, no idea, I am just here uh, for the CLE credit. Stop asking me questions. I'll give you just a minute let us know what do you think the answer is. Just a couple more seconds. Uh, just so you know, Greg's answer to this was no idea. I'm just here for the CLE credit. Okay. All right. Uh, the outstanding answer, our vote so far is 47% that predecessor covered both. Well, I am here to tell you that the court found it only covered the predecessor corporate entity. So first, the court looked at longstanding law that if you're going to release a party, uh, that party has to be readily identifiable so that a stranger to the contract could come, uh, read the provision, and know exactly who is uh, released. Uh, the court then looked at, you know, the generally accepted meaning of the word predecessor. And the court considered that it can have multiple meanings. Uh, it could mean predecessor in title. It could mean predecessor corporate entity. But the court's conclusion was you can't just say anything goes. The court has to consider the word in the context used. And so here the court splits it up and says, well, what was being released? It was the claims related to the tract who is being discharged, and it looked at the list of the people, the entities being discharged, and essentially the court said that whole list referred back to Petro Canyon because it was their officers, directors, representatives, agents, it was anybody who could be acting potentially in Petro Canyon's uh, shoes. Um, so even though 
in a different context, predecessor and title might have applied. Uh, not here, it was the corporate predecessor entity. Uh, I'm sorry, Megan, I fell asleep. Have we gotten to the CLE credit yet? Have we gotten to that? Sorry. Okay. No. Well, yeah, the number, the number for the CLE credit is coming. Not yet. Not yet. You got to pay attention. All right. So now we're going to go to squatters. Um, we're going to look at the at the issues of squatters. This is the PBEX versus Dorchester case. It really was a dispute over uh, two parties who were claiming the right to a, a non-op uh, working interest. Um, uh that originally began in the mid 80s so in 1990 torch uh had allegedly assigned its non-operating working interest to dorchester's predecessors not you know we now tie into the uh what, what megan was just talking about and signed a division order that showed torch's interest as zero percent for that working interest in 2016 though torch assigned that same interest to pbx and contended that it had mistakenly notified the operator in 1990, remember this is 26 years later, of an assignment to Dorchester's predecessors. Now, one of the issues, and, and, and it's not real clear when you read the uh, opinion, but I caught one, we, we were involved in this case, so I called one of my appellant partners who was involved and, and, and kind of got, got, got the sort of the backstage view of it. And so, uh, there was really a number of different mineral interests that had been assigned back in 1990. There were NRIs and there were other types of interest. And and, um, and and so there was a real dispute over whether this non-operated working interest was was referred to and was part of this assignment. Um, and hence, was there a, an effective uh, transfer of this interest back in 1990 to Dorchester's predecessors? Um, so both of them uh pbx and torch sought a deck a deck action declaratory judgment that the working interest belonged to torch and that torch then uh properly subsequently assigned it to pbx now in the suit dorchester argued that it and its predecessors had performed all the functions of a working interest owner since 1990 they they paid their share of expenses they uh received revenues they made elections under the joa etc so therefore at a minimum Putting aside, you know, and they still contended that the that the assignment included the the working interest, but regardless, at a minimum, they had acquired the interest by adverse possession. Because remember, this has been going on for 26 years. PBX and Torch argued, you know what, you can't get a, a, a working interest by adverse possession because it's non-possessory nature, um, and it's just not it's not done. And and for those of you. For lawyers who want to try to remember the elements of adverse possession, this is it. Um, open and notorious, continuous, uninterrupted. Got a certain statutory period. It's got to be hostile and it's got to be exclusive, right? So now, uh, these are the facts. And so what would you do if you were the judge? Uh, would you say, look, if there was no transfer of the working interest in the 1990 assignment, you find for PBX, who was the later transferee. Uh, B, you find for Dorchester, the 1990, the original transferee or their predecessors under the doctrine of adverse possession, regardless of whether that assignment actually um, included the working interest, you could play mediator and just split the baby and give each, each party half of their interest. Or you can apply the rule in Shelley's case. And, and again, there's double bonus points for anybody who can remember and recite the rule in Shelley's case without looking it up. So if you'll go ahead and take a minute and, and um, provide your answer to this. All right, so we'll give it another second or two for people to respond, um, for those who are still awake, and we'll see what they're gonna do. All right. Um, let's go, I'm trying to get to the next, trying to get to it. All right, here we go. So we got a fairly even split. 36% uh, of you would say, if, there was, if it was not in the assignment, they don't get it. 45% says no, if they held it for as long as they did, uh then they get it under adverse possession and approximately nine percent of you each are going to split the baby or you're going to apply the rule in shelley's case and i guarantee you the nine percent don't know what the rule in shelley's case is because no one knows what the rule in shelley's case is um here's what the court did the court declined 
to, to actually create this distinction between operating and non-operating interests. And it found that the working interest was possessory and subject to adverse possession. It kind of went through the fact that Torch had failed to exercise its rights for over 25 years. Uh, Dork Gesture had, operate, had, had, had acted as the operator, the owner of this working interest. It was, not, it was obviously a non-operated working interest. Um, uh, it actually found an analogous situation in the landlord-tenant because Texas law allows uh, adverse possession to be established through a tenant who doesn't actually own it, but, but um, is possessing the property. Um, and so the court really found when the, when the operator began paying the production proceeds and a request for payment, lecture request, everything to Dorchester, the operator was recognizing Dorchester as the owner of the working interest. And the, to the court, it was clear that Dorchester had adversely possessed the working interest uh, for the past 26 years. But again, as in, as in the other case, there was a very rigorous dissent and PBEX has filed his petition for review with the Texas Supreme Court. So we're going to see if indeed uh, a working interest can be adversely possessed. Great. Um, I have another fun and interesting case for you, depending on how you define fun and interesting. Uh, this case is regarding the Texas Railroad Commission. And on the screen, you can see a picture. This is the engineering division uh, and it's a photo of them at the Capitol building, building in the early 1900s. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Okay, um, for a little background for those who may not be familiar, the Texas legis legislature gave the Railroad Commission the power to make and enforce rules and orders regarding the conservation of oil and gas and to prevent the waste of oil and gas. Uh, over the years, the Texas legislature has enacted statutes governing pooling of lands for oil and gas. We're going to talk about pooling. Uh, but there are zero statutes that address production sharing agreements, or PSAs, for horizontally drilled wells. On top of that, the commission itself has not adopted any rules in the administrative code concerning production sharing agreements. So uh, taking a step back, you know, what is a production sharing agreement and what is pooling and how are they different? So pooling is combining tracks from, uh, from more than one lease, oil and gas lease, for the drilling of a well where the production from any of the tracks and the pooled unit is treated as production from all of the tracks. And that is uh, generally related to uh, the traditional vertical wells. An allocation well is a horizontal well that uh, uh, traverses across the boundary line of different tracks. Um, and generally, if there is not an agreement as to how the production uh, proceeds are going to be shared, uh, the person that gets paid is the person who owns the tract uh, where the minerals are actually captured from. And a production sharing agreement is where the interest owners on the various tracks agree on how to share production in that allocation well, for example, uh, regardless of where the oil is being taken. Uh, so what does the commission do with respect to production sharing agreements? Well, they do request information about PSAs in their forms, and they do grant permits for wells that are the sub subject of PSAs. How did they get there? In 2008, the commission granted a permit application pursuant to a PSA, and uh, when it did that, it directed its staff that into the future, uh, you shall permit uh, issue permits for PSA wells using the following standard. Um, if the operator can certify that at least 65% of the working and royalty interest owners and in each component tract have signed the production sharing agreement. Uh, so just take a close look. This is the language and this is the standard. And we're looking at at least 65% have signed the production sharing agreement. Uh, so uh, here's an interesting question. What is the source of the Railroad Commission's authority to set this 65% threshold? Uh, so let's, let's think about it. Could it be the Texas Constitution? 
uh, the Texas Administrative Code. Uh, how about the Texas Natural Resources Code? Or just good old-fashioned divine right? Any thoughts on what the uh, source of uh, authority for the commission to pass this uh, or to set this standard of 65% is? Take a minute. Let us know what you think. What is the source of their authority? Uh, let's see how the polling is coming out. <laughs> okay, uh, we've got a tie uh, for 20%, including divine right. I love that. Uh, we've got a good 40% leaning towards the Texas Natural Resources Code. Okay, well, um, I hate to break it to you, this is a trick question uh, because there is not an answer. Uh, it is still an open question. And the court, uh, in this case, specifically refused to address the issue or the question. Um, this is interesting because the commission's authority to set this 65% standard was hotly contested by the lessors and the commission in this case. But ultimately, the court avoided the question entirely because under the facts of the case, the court found uh, that the operator and the commission failed to show that the 65% standard was met. So let's look at how we get there with these specific facts uh, in this Opiella case. So stepping back, the Opiella, the lessors, uh, were very upset because the commission granted uh, the operator a permit to drill a horizontal well as a PSA well that crossed through their land, their tract. They were upset because under their lease, they have an anti-pooling clause that prohibits pooling, quote, in any manner, whatever. Uh, the lessors did not sign a consent to pool uh, and they did not sign a production sharing agreement. So they're essentially coming in and saying the commission should have never um, uh, awarded this permit. In essence, they were arguing that the PSA well is pooling by another name and it's prohibited by the lease. Well, first, the court held uh, that there's a distinction between pooling PSAs and allocation wells, that those are not the same thing. And so the uh, OPLA's anti-pooling clause, that alone does not prohibit drilling under a uh, production sharing agreement. Uh, so that is a, a win for operators um, uh, in Texas. Uh, the court, importantly, looked uh, when it made this distinction, it was really bothered by the fact that how parties share in the proceeds of a well can differ significantly if you're talking about pooling or PSAs. Um, and so that, that played a big role in the court's uh, decision here. Uh, next, the court found that the operator failed to show a good faith uh, claim for its right to drill, finding that they could not meet the 65% threshold. So let's look at what uh, the operator and the commission used to get to the 65%. As you can see, uh, about 15% had signed a production sharing agreement. Uh, about half a percent uh, signed a ratification. And 49% approximately signed a consent to pool. So they added all that together and said the 65% was met. Uh, the court here, however, disagreed entirely. The court said that the 65% standard set by the commission was about how many uh, people signed a production sharing agreement. And because the interests involved when you're talking about pooling and production sharing agreements are not the same, you cannot just add those all up to get to the 65%. Uh, that's why the court said, you know, we're not proceeded you, that you can add them all up. The court leaves open the door that if an operator can show that under a consent to pool and under a PSA, 
if both call for the same sharing of production, then perhaps in that context, uh, an operator and the commission could find the 65% is met. But because uh, that did not, was not present here, um, the court found, you know, the commission erred by issuing the permit. Um, so overall, there's it's favorable ruling for well operators in that you can get around an anti-pooling clause for a PSA well, but we've left open this question of does the commission have authority to adopt the 65% threshold rule? Uh, and this is another case to follow going forward. A petition for review has been filed with the Texas Supreme Court, so we'll have to wait and see what they have to say. All right, Greg. Okay, thanks. Uh, yeah, we're gonna uh, we're gonna speed it up a little bit because we're starting to run out of time. But uh, we now have CLE information. So uh, perfect. Thank you. Yes. Uh, please see the CLE request form link in the Q and A box below. If you practice in New York or are joining by phone, please add the affirmation code also in the Q and A box in the CLE request form below. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, uh, since it's been 80 degrees here in Houston, I figured we'd talk about Winter Storm Uri, right? Um, and so before we start talking about it, here's the poll question. What is the coldest recorded temperature in Texas history? Four degrees, zero degrees, nine degrees below zero, or 23 degrees below zero? Go ahead and submit your, your, your best guess here real quickly, and then we'll show you what the, or I'll tell you what the right answer is. Okay, we've got some that are submitting. Give it another minute or two, or a second or two, and then we will reveal the answer, reveal the results anyway. Here we go. So uh, most people went with nine degrees below zero. The next guess was 23 degrees below zero. The, act, the correct answer is 23 degrees below zero. And that actually happened twice in Texas. Um, uh, the first time was February 12th of 1899 up in the Texas Panhandle. Uh, it reportedly was so cold throughout the state. Uh, there was a, a severe blizzard that hit that there was a sheet of ice that coated Galveston Bay, if you can imagine that. Um, and then in fe on February 8th of 1933, another 23 degree below zero day was recorded in Gaines County, which is out in West Texas. So. Thank goodness we're not dealing with that anymore. All right, um, so let's just look at this. Um, whoops. So, I'm sorry, let me go back. Uh, so according to the University of Houston survey, 69% of Texans lost power at some point uh, during Feb uh, the winter storm year, February 14th to 20th of 2021. Almost half of Texans lost water service during that time. The Federal Reserve Bank, um, estimated that the losses, I'm sorry, uh, the, the, uh, I'm getting ahead of myself here. There were 246 deaths attributable to winter storm Uri by the uh, State Department of Health, ranging from one to 102. And the Federal Bank, uh, Reserve Bank of Dallas estimated that the storm related losses were anywhere from 80 billion to 130 billion. And yes, that's billion with a B. Um, and so what do you think would happen next when there's losses like that? Well, surprise, surprise, the lawsuits start to come out. Um, multiple lawsuits are filed. Uh, an MDL was actually established uh, back in 2021 when over 35 lawsuits had been filed. Uh, not surprising that ERCOT was the primary defendant along with a number of other defendants. Almost 90% of Texans rely on ERCOT for their electricity services. This is a map showing all of the all of the counties in which ERCOT uh, facilitates the electricity services to Texans. Now, the surprise to a lot of people was the inclusion of a number of different parties besides ERCOT, which included transmission and, and distribution utilities, generator and co-defendants, and natural gas defendants. The NGD, and NGDs, as we called them, were natural gas producers, processors, storage facilities, pipelines, you name it. Uh, anybody that was in the chain was included in these lawsuits. Um, and, and again, it, 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 it doesn't make sense, but when you look at where ERCOT's generating capacity was, over half of it's from the natural gas. So that's probably 
why the plaintiff's attorneys decided to include all of the gas uh, participants up and down the stream in these lawsuits. So ultimately, thousands of plaintiffs were uh, were in, uh, included, and hundreds of defendants were included in this M in this M uh, MDL. Claims against the MGD MGDs and others were basically negligence, gross negligence, tortious interference, private nuisance, civil conspiracy. Um, after multiple briefing, after a long long time and a lot of lot of work, the MDL judge issued an order back uh, in January of last year dismissing all the claims against the NGDs in the four test cases. You'd think that'd be the end, right? No, then shortly after that, some more lawsuits were filed where they were bringing these market manipulation theories, um, basically claiming that all of these players in the natural gas industry had colluded um, and, and manipulated the natural gas prices. And again, these were, uh, 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 the Circle X was an entity that went out and bought these claims and were, were, were asserting them on behalf of all of these individual plaintiffs. They tried to get it removed from the MDL, the judge denied. I've got in here, the order's currently being appealed. It's actually uh, been denied now, so it's firmly in the MDL. Um, on December 14th, just at the end of last year, the first court of appeals granted mandamus relief to the wholesale power generators because um, they had not gotten out on their motions to dismiss, but they said that the plaintiff's cause of action had no basis, and so they ordered the MDL judge to grant their motions, the power generators, um, a similar motion is pending on behalf of the, the transmission distribution utilities. Um, again, one of the one of the corollaries of this is is the big dispute over whether um, the uh, Public Utility Commission exceeded its authority by by setting the price of electricity at, at the at the rate that it did. Um, that's now going up on the uh, up to the Texas Supreme Court, and that's a huge issue. A lot of a lot of briefing back and forth on that. Um, and then on June 23rd of last year, the Texas Supreme Court ruled that ERCOT was a governmental entity and thus entitled to sovereign immunity, and all of those claims should be dismissed. This is not unique to Texas. Oklahoma um, is, is, is attempting to gear up for this. Um, Kansas, um, Kansas Attorney General announced an investigation. He's actually filed a, a lawsuit, and then a number of natural gas suppliers were sued in, in federal court in Kansas. Uh, toward the end of last year, um, uh, alleging that they had overcharged during the uh, during the winter storm year that hit Kansas as well, so uh, the damages there are in excess of 300 million. So I know we're going to go through the last couple of slides really quickly. All right, Megan, I'm going to turn it over to you. Yes, this one's very uh, quick. So we've got uh, in 1994, the Hogs executed a oil and gas lease to 3B. Uh, then again, in 1998, they executed a new lease to 3B, covering 120 of the same acres, uh, just to make sure everybody could get confused. And then under the 1998 lease, 3B drilled the hog number two well. Uh, then in 2005, 3B executed an assignment of a number of its oil and gas interests, but it only expressly referred to the 1994 lease and the hog number two well it did not expressly reference the 1998 lease. Uh, so I'm gonna skip the poll out of interest of time. The conclusion was the 1998 lease was assigned. Uh, so all you need to know is that the uh, courts will construe a deed to confer upon the grantee the greatest estate that the terms will permit. And because there was no excluding language or reservation language with respect to the 1998 lease, it went along for the ride. All you, Greg. All right, so uh, just to, to wrap it up, I thought we would spend just a couple of minutes talking about decommissioning, uh, primarily because in the invitation we had a, we had the a picture of, a, of an offshore oil and gas rig, so I figured we better work something into it. But uh, this is the first page of a 575 page report from Bohm. And I originally planned on going through each page one by one. Um, but in the interest of time, I will not do that. But I want to hit, hit a few highlights, right? Uh, and, and really the, why this is relevant even today, even though the decommissioning has been around, is that some recent bankruptcies have really uh, highlighted the potential huge costs that are associated with the decommissioning of all of the structures in the Gulf of Mexico. It's estimated there are 14,000 unplugged oil and gas wells in the Gulf of Mexico. 
And according to a review um, by LSU and, and, and reviewing some of the data from the from Bessie, uh, estimated cost for decommissioning as of 2022 in the deep water, which is water exceeding 400 feet, was 24.3 billion, that's billion with a B. And for the shallow water or the shelf, that's about 6.3 billion. And I thought this was fascinating. This is from, I think this is actually from Bohm, one of their reports, but it, it, it basically shows when production first started, the number of platforms, the number of wells drilled. And really what you take from this is you realize how many wells and how many platforms are still out there that have not been decommissioned and not been plugged and abandoned. Um, and it's just a mind boggling number when you start start looking at everything and really focusing on it. Um, and why it's important is uh, under the applicable CFRs, what decommissioning means is ending oil, gas, or sulfur operations and returning the lease, the pipeline right away or the easement to a condition that meets the requirement of Bessie and the other agencies. So it's up to them as to whether, whether you have properly met your decommissioning obligations, but it's not just the current owner, it's all lessees, owners of operating rights and their predecessors. Again, that predecessors issue keeps, keeps making their way into, into, into these issues. Everybody's jointly and severally liable for the decommissioning obligations. And a report from the General Accounting Office estimated that less than 10% of the projected decommissioning liability were actually secured by bonds, which means over 90% are gonna be either on, on the backs of those who are still um, financially able, or they may not be covered at all. Uh, real quickly, we want to thank Miguel Escobar, who had helped us put this uh, presentation together. Thanks, Miguel. And um, unfortunately, I don't know that we've got time, but um, I do know if there's any Q&A questions, uh, we'll be able to respond to those by, um, uh, by, by email. So um, I know we're a couple of minutes past our time, but I want to thank everybody for attending. Um, and uh, we wish you well on the rest of the day. Thank you. Thank you.